I'll bring the lights down when you start to. Be good with the lights coming down when you start to. Yeah. All right, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming this week. Glad that we have food here in time. I think that's a real improvement. Um, so our first speaker is Ryan Jones, uh, who's a second year master's student under Dr. Paula Jones out at the Denver Museum of Nature, Nature and Science. Uh, Ryan graduated Hope College in 2013 with a BS in biology. He worked for five years for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Um, and his current work is studying evolutionary biology within arachnid systems. Um, and he's also interested in exploring ecology and ethology with Interactive. So please join me in welcoming Ryan. Thanks. Thank you for being here. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, for the opportunity to speak. Oh, yeah. So um, whatever happens in taxonomy is every once in a while you gotta, like all sciences, go back and, and revise what's already been established. So this is very much what we're doing um, at the Museum of Nature and Science. So I uh, studied so camel spiders, which are one of 12 extant groups of arachnids called sulfugids. Um, they are cursorial fossorial, uh, which means that they either run on the ground or they dig a uh, burrow. Uh, they are desert adapted. There's a very few exceptions that might live in um, some ecotones within a rainforest system. Uh, they're opportunist spiders, meaning they're going to eat anything they think they can take down without sufficient injury to themselves. There's over 1,100 described species spread over 12 families. Uh, they occur everywhere except for the poles and in the Australia Pacific Islands. Uh, and nobody studies these things because they're hard to catch and they're impossible to breed and keep in a lab setting. So um, my group is the only active group of researchers in uh, North America. Um, here's a couple examples from the uh, different families of uh, so fugids, uh, my favorite is the top middle, that's a hexopid, which is in Africa called the fuzzy bear camel spider. It's very cute. Those are one of the fossorial types you might find. Um, some of the kind you would find here in North America, like the top left and uh, up here the top right. And just to give you guys kind of context of where sulfugids lay in the overall uh, systematic scheme of arachnids, uh, here's a plate of a few historical hypotheses in which how they're related to the other arachnid groups. Uh, previously, they've been more closely associated with pseudoscorpions, and that's kind of moved around a bit over the years when we use different evidence and data. Uh, more recently, they're now part of sister groups, things like mites, ticks, hooded tick spiders, and the uh, clade called Tetrapulmonata, which has got spiders, envelope edges, um, skies on it, and your pigs in it. And then if we include fossil data, we now believe that they are more closely related to mites than anything else uh, and share a common ancestor with ticks. So the state of North American sulfugid tech, uh, taxonomy currently there are two families here in North America, Amtrigidae and Arumobatidae. Uh, uh, my group is focused on Arumobatidae first. Uh, that's divided into two subfamilies encapsulating about 188 described species. Um, they're not all accurate. I'm going to go over that in a bit. And here are the giants in which uh, basically the shoulders I stand upon. So Mark Muma started actively researching with his dissertation published in 1951 from the University of Florida. Uh, he basically laid the groundwork for Jack Burkhart to join him as a student uh, in 1962. Jack would continue to work with him up until Muma passed in the late 90s. Um, and he is an active collaborator in our lab. 
Um, Jack doesn't have a PhD. Uh, he just got a master's. He's actually a retired high school teacher. So um, he doesn't have an official title. However, he has definitely earned his place uh, among the Giants when it comes to this very small field. And then Dr. Paula Cushing is the Embryo Curator over at the museum. Uh, that's who I work with. And she got suckered into working with this uh, system in 2002 by Jack. Okay. And now here we are. We got our NSF funding finally. After uh, being promised back in February, we got the chip cut due to start October, August 1st. Um, so left to right is Erica Garcia. You might see her around. She's a new PhD student just starting this fall. Jack Brookhart was a senior researcher. Warren Savory, who's also um, a consultant, but also putting together our website, www.sofugit.info. Lance Herrera, our undergrad student at uh, Metropolitan State. Dr. Paul Cushing, uh, Dr. Matthew Graham, who's the co-PI at Eastern Connecticut State University, who's focusing on the biogeography aspect of our grant, and then me. So there's a lot of issues in which uh, we've, we're, we're trying to address when it comes to um, revising the taxonomy. Like I said before, there comes a time in every field where uh, a new wave of research has to kind of revise or replace the old hypotheses and thoughts of the past based on new methodology. Uh, this is no exception. So we're dealing with a lot of poor quality keys and descriptions. Um, species only known from one sex and one type only, or type only. Which means that they were described maybe in 1955, never before or never seen again. And so if we find a species that we're not familiar with, we don't know if it's that species that was described once and not seen again, or if it's something new. Uh, especially if it's a male or a female, we don't know the other sex. Species based on arbitrary population ranges. So I've seen this quite a bit where it seems like species that are otherwise morphologically identical. Uh, for some reason, there are different species that exist in Colorado, and different species if they're in Utah. So we're trying to address that as well. Arbitrary distinctions between variation and new species. So for some reason, uh, variation of morphological characters is allowed for some species, but for others, every morphological difference is a new species. We're not sure why that is. Uh, I believe I have to synonymize quite a few species. So that's one of the biggest headaches I've had to deal with. There's a lack of useful characters. Uh, prolific homoplasty, which is basically uh, another term for convergent evolution. So they kind of converge for the same patterns and teeth, which is what we use quite a bit um, determining species. And I believe this is not really based on any publication or real hard data yet, but based on my past year of looking at these things, thousands of them under a microscope, I believe that there is some introgression and blending of characters happening in the hybrid zones um, in populations where more than one closely related species um, lives in the symmetry. tree. Um, and that's because they exhibit mutually exclusive characters on a key. So basically, if we're normally able to branch off to one closely related group, I find both of those characters that shouldn't exist together based on what we know. The chelicera, the really powerful jaws, uh, are one of the key things we use in, in diagnosing species. The one on the left is a male. Uh, we know it because it has a straight fixed finger at the top. Uh, the male uses that to insert the sperm pack into the female. Um, however, there are exceptions to that rule. There's an entire group in which that fixed finger is curved and has teeth. Um, on the female on the right, you can see the, the curvature it also has teeth. Um, these fondle teeth can be diagnostic sometimes, and depending on the group. Um, the orientation of these teeth can be diagnostic, whether they're swept forward, they're triangulate, there's a cleft, whether or not this tooth here is quote unquote in the notch of the principal tooth, it, it doesn't make sense, does it? Um, and then whether or not there's another separate tooth right here. Sometimes there's accessory teeth up in this final notch, and then there's also teeth on the other side of this fixed finger or moving finger. And keto taxi from move on is basically the orientation of the CD around the chelicer. So the CD um, may be used in uh, sexual pheromone detection, but also uh, used in keeping food particles out of their uh, gullet, so to speak. Um, this is these are a plate of propotidium. So this is basically their um, cephalothorax. If you think of a, a spider, um, it has their ganglia in their head. So they exhibit 
lots of different color patterns. Um, and in some cases, color can be diagnostic. Otherwise, it can just be wildly variable. So that's something we're trying to figure out for what species are they consistent, what species uh, just are all over the place. Uh, these are structured called uh, apile on the pedipalps. Pedipalps are the foremost appendages. They use, they raise in the air when they run along the ground uh, to detect uh, vibrations, air movements, and possibly chemicals as well. We believe these play a role in um, sex hormone detection because they're only prevalent in males. However, it seems sometimes they're there and sometimes they're not, um, which we're not sure why that is. If a species is supposed to have it and it doesn't, and it morphologically is identical to a species that does have these, we're basically just resort to throw it in as near that most you know, species. So I've had a lot of frustration with these characters in particular. And same with these. And these are tinidia, modified CD on the underside of the male abdomen. Um, we're not sure what they do. I'm hoping to use SCM to figure out what that is, and maybe some histology as well. And some species can anywhere from zero to six. Some species are dead set at two. Um, some have even more than that. So this is another one of those characters in where a species can be morphologically identical, but yet they'll vary in just this alone. So it doesn't make sense to me why some species can have a range and some have only have one particular number of items. So what are we to do? So we're gonna try to mix in morphology with DNA, and this was done in 2015 by my advisor uh, at all. So she used mitochondrial nuclear DNA uh, with exemplar species. So she took a handful of representatives, depending on what she could get her hands on, um, from each species group and genus. And she put it together with a maximum likelihood and, and Bayesian inference into a majority rule consensus tree. So basically, each node on here is a hypothesis based on uh, how similar those DNA strains are. Something to point out is all of the um, Family or mobility is monophyletic, which means they all share the most recent common ancestor. Therobatinae, which is the troublesome subfamily, uh, which is thankfully Erica's problem for her PhD because that's a headache, is all sorts of mess. So you can see it's kind of spread out uh, down here. There's one solid group up here and a couple of groupings up here. Uh, the red and blue are two separate genus, or genera, I'm sorry. And it basically seems like uh, when they came to describe them, they flipped a coin, put it in one genus or the other. The subfamily Urobatinae is monophyletic, which is great with the exception of the horror babies up there, which we're pretty sure doesn't actually belong in Urobatinae. And the species group plays, which are mine, uh, Novitic Skaber, Palpes, and Palpicitulosis are um, pretty much monophyletic, except for. This clade right here is only in California. Other groups that are in that species group are up here throughout the United States, all the way up to Kansas, Nebraska. So what we're going to be doing now is using ultra-conserved elements, which are, uh, just as they sound, um, sequences of the DNA that are highly conserved over disparate taxa. Uh, so we're going to have over 400 plus DNA sequence according to our pilot study. Uh, we're going to try to get all aerobatic species we're going to do both males and females. The previous study was based on males only. Um, we're going to try to include specimens that I believe to be in suspected hybrid zones from different populations other than those of uh, the type of locality, which is where the species was described from. And with this technology, we can use older museum specimens up to a couple of decades old. And how UCE works is uh, the DNA flanking around that core UCE region that's conserved is highly variable. So the further you get out, the more variation you get. So uh, the similarity between two species is what's parsimony important. Parsimony standpoint. We're also going to be using scan electron, scan electron microscopy, which I almost wish I had waited later in the semester to do this because we just got the bench in last week um, to actually look for really small characters that would be diagnostic and more. And of course, we have to go out to the field in order to get all these specimens because we have 188 species to try to collect. Um, we set up these lights in the middle of the desert, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona, <clears throat> and uh, they come running to these lights, uh, most likely because they're attracted to all the insects that are phototactic. And then we also set up these long-term pit bull traps, which is this is garden fencing with pit, like a, a glycopropylene 
um, traps set the boxes midway at the ends. And so I'm coming at the end here, quick story. So we had a stopover in Coconino National Forest. We stayed at the Bonito Campground, which is right next to the uh, Sunset Crater, um, a volcano that erupted about roughly 1,000 years ago. This is what the campground looks like. We had a permit here because we were going to try to collect, um, but we weren't really expecting to be able to get anything because this is not the right substrate. So as we're there, we're setting up camp. We decided to set up a light on our campsite. Paula turns to me and says, hey, I don't really think we're going to catch anything here for you. I said, no. And literally three seconds after I say that, I look down and there's this nice huge female at my feet. So we take it back to the museum. We ID it as Romobates Barmonas. I look in, scan our database and say, okay, we're is this usual? This is what traditional, not traditional, but this is what we know Romobates Barmonas look like. Those are all caught by USGS a couple of miles northwest of where we were. Bonito's right there, okay? And these are the ones that we found. Completely different color scheme. So we believe that that is evidence of an ecomorph uh, on the volcanic rock. So uh, we're hoping that it's backed up by the DNA, but if that holds true, that'll be the first example of such kind of an ecomorph in Arachnida. Questions for Ryan? So, you just, what were the, you said they were most closely related to mites, is that what you said? Yes, mites, yep. Yeah, so those really, really small things, they're ectoparasites. Okay. Yeah. So, and why, um, why those sample sites you don't send them from Colorado? Why we don't sample in Colorado? Yeah. Uh, plenty of the species that are in Colorado, we have plenty of. Okay. Yeah. And we actually get probably um, maybe a dozen of them sent to us a year by people who catch them in their houses in Colorado. I have a naive question. Yeah. You showed those four little things on the underside of the nails. Yeah. yeah. Right. So you say you're going to look at those under SEM and try and figure out their function? Yep. Having no clue about what you can learn from that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. what would you hope to see slash find that tell you what their function is? Uh, so there's a couple of hypotheses. Um, Jack Rickard believes that they cover the spiracles um, as their environment does experience flash flooding. Um, I don't believe that because they have spiracles that don't have these structures on them. There has to be some other way for them to avoid drowning. Um, I think that we might find really small pores from pheromone excretion or some other chemical excretion. Um, or my alternative hypothesis, there's just vestigial. Um, there, there's no purpose because you can find some leftover on the females. So if you did an SEM, mm -hmm. there was like no pores, no structure there, that's what you learned, like that it was vestigial. That would be my next guess. I'm also I'm also um, wanting to do histology underneath this to see if the what what superstructures are under like on the uh, the basal part of this. Anything else? Alrighty. All right, so we're switching gears here a little bit. Uh, our next speaker is Andrew Boddicker, who's a research assistant in the Mosier Lab. Um, Andrew did his undergrad at the University of Delaware and did his master's right here at UCD. Uh, his thesis was on cultivation and genomic sequencing of novel nitrate oxidizing bacteria. 
Uh, he won the CLAS Outstanding Master Student Award. Um, and in looking at his CV, I found out that he's an Eagle Scout, which I suppose I should have known. So please welcome Andrew. Cool. Guys, thanks for coming. Um, today I'm really just covering most of what I did in my master's as well as several months after getting up for publication. Um, and it's focused on the genomic profiling of these four Candidatus nitrotoga species that we um, looked at their metabolic potential and environmental distribution. So microorganisms play crucial roles in biogeochemical cycles. Um, importantly here we're showing the nitrogen cycle. Uh, most nitrogen is found in the atmosphere where it's very inert and is not usable by living organisms, yet every organism needs nitrogen to survive. Uh, that nitrogen can be fixed and then used by different types of organisms, and it can go through a variety of different redox reactions and eventually can end up back as N2 gas um, in the atmosphere. Each of those different reactions is mediated by um, various types of microbes as well as occasionally by uh, higher organisms. However, uh, with the recent anthropogenic shift of where nitrogen is coming from, mostly with this Haber-Bosch um, production system of artificial nitrogen fixation, the amount of fixed nitrogen in the environment has at least doubled and is projected to keep rising, particularly with uses of um, such as ammonia-based fertilizers. So what we don't know is how this will impact this cycle as it stands. And we want to know more about the individual organisms that we know already um, perform these actions and what, how they might react to changes later on. So we're just going to focus on one of these stages in the nitrogen cycle, nitrite to oxidation. It's NO2 nitrite oxidized to nitrate to NO3. We see those throughout the presentation. So um, nitrate oxidation is only known to be performed by bacteria currently. Um, and they are both phylogenetically and physiologically very diverse. Uh, they're known NOB as of 2016, fit into at least four different phyla, which are um, very high taxonomic levels, and at least seven different genera. Uh, we focused in this study on um, freshwater. So the best studied freshwater uh, NOB to date are the Nitrospira and the Nitrobacter, um, which you'll see throughout this as well. And then we'll talk about the nitrotoga, which are right here. So in this study, what we did um, several years ago, we now collected samples from both water and sediment from around the Denver metro area, including some samples right across the street um, from Cherry Creek. Brought those back to the lab and put them in a very nutrient limiting media where nitrite was, um, should be the only electron donor available for growth. Meaning we we're trying to um, reduce the number of different species within those cultures as much as we can over the course of years. Uh, we measured growth through the consumption of nitrite. We have a colorimetric assay that helps us with that, know when the nitrite has been consumed. Uh, and then after about two years, we extracted DNA from these enrichment cultures, uh, purified, sequenced, and then went through a process of assembling genomes focusing in on those nitrite oxidizing bacteria, which we did find, and then spent quite a while on analysis of those genomes. So there's four different um, colors shown here representing four different cultures that we had in total. So one of the first steps we took was to look for the 16S ribosomal RNA gene within these four organisms, which is uh, very highly conserved across bacteria. Um, and we found that it is most closely related to this Candidatus genus Nitrotoga. Candidatus meaning candidate um, because there, uh, up until recently, had been no confirmed isolates of anything from this genus. So we don't need to see the individual um, nodes on this phylogenetic tree, but our cultures are highlighted in blue and then in yellow. There were four other previous enrichment cultures that had been found throughout literature, um, dating back only to 2007 when the genus was first described. So we knew that there was potential for these organisms, but there were no available um, genome sequences and no um, descriptions of the organisms as a whole. So with that in mind, we started comparing um, within these four organisms that we found, um, labeled by site up here. And here in the unhighlighted cells of this table, we're showing the average nucleotide identity 
of genome against genome comparisons, which is basically a way to line up the whole genomes and try to find how um, similar they are. All of these were between low 90% and mid 85%, you know. Um, and the currently accepted threshold for ANI and microbial speciation is 95%. All of these fall below that threshold. Um, so we we're proposing that these represent four unique species within this genus. Um, over here, we have the average amino acid identity, which is slightly higher based on um, the conservation of amino acids versus DNA. So not only did we look to see how identical they were across the whole genome, we looked, uh, we formed this pan genome of predicted coding sequences within each of those four genome sequences. Uh, so these were formed into protein clusters, PCs here. 1,800 of those protein clusters were found in all four of those genomes based on homology. And an additional 2,200 were found either alone in a single genome like here, or shared between two to three of the different genomes. So we know that they are, um, have actual unique coding sequences within each one, um, which could perform some different functions. However, we didn't find any key metabolic genes which, within these 2,200 protein clusters. Most of those actually did not have a known function, um, and others included various defense mechanisms or transporters. But most of the key metabolic genes are found as expected within this core genome. One of which we focused on, the nitrite oxidoreductase protein, <laughs> is the key enzyme for nitrite oxidation. Um, and it's found, it was known to be found in two different forms. One in which uh, it's the alpha subunit, which is thought to be the, um, where the reaction actually takes place, is facing either the periplasm or facing into the cytoplasm. So these are two different types, all of which were bound by this uh, integral gamma subunit. And what we found in our genomes within this gamma subunit that we identified, we did not find any predicted um, transmembrane helices, which you can look find within the sequence itself to suggest that it's bound to the membrane. So we're suggesting that um, the nitrotoga nitrate oxidoreductase enzyme, all three subunits, is actually found up within the periplasm, not bound to the membrane. And that's unique because um, this NXR protein is actually extremely phylogenetically diverse, and we've just added to that quite a bit more. So down here, I know you can't read these too closely, but in blue, we're showing the cytoplasmic facing um, NXRA subunits, and in pink right here are those periplasmic facing ones. However, this phylogenetic distance is huge. Uh, this is a whole family of enzymes we're showing here, some of which in the middle actually perform entirely different functions in entirely different organisms, meaning um, this NXR is more closely related to this enzyme that does a different function than it is to this NXR, which theoretically does the same function. So huge phylogenetic distance here, and then our four nitrotoga sequences are in red right here, which is additionally still very far removed from this cluster in pink. Took it a little bit further to look for conserved um, binding sequences within that protein sequence, uh, conserved residues, I should say, uh, for nitrite or nitrate binding. We found four of the five um, sequences, uh, amino acid residues in light blue here were conserved, and that fifth one is found to be variable between even other described um, NXR proteins. So this was enough to suggest an alternative um, evolutionary trajectory of this nitrite oxidoreductase reductase um, from these periplasmic ones. There's some evidence to suggest that there might have been a horizontal gene transfer um, long time ago, maybe from here over to somewhere within this tree, leading to different variations, um, but we don't know that for sure. So we also saw um, these results were confirmed by another group that published right around the same time. Um, here we highlighted the NXR, they show it um, actually in the periplasm uh, soluble. As well, there were plenty of other things going on within these cells that we took a deeper dive into, including um, different electron transport systems that suggest metabolisms other than just nitrate oxidation. 
um, which would be important for ecophysiology. We don't know if they're actually using nitrate all the time, if they have other metabolisms available. So here on the top, we're just showing um, more classic aerobic nitrate oxidation, in which here in orange is the NXR, oxidizing nitrate to nitrate, and then the green um, four is the terminal oxidase. Those are the two you'll need to keep track of here. Um, so they can gain energy just by oxidizing nitrite. There's also um, evidence to support aerobic uh, um, metabolisms with other electron donors, including potentially organic carbon sources. Um, if they can bring organic carbon into the cell, um, all the genes necessary for breakdown of organic carbon are present within the genome, um, but we don't know if they're actually forming this or not. Similarly, anaerobic respiration is theoretically possible with the NXR operating in reverse, um, reducing nitrate back to nitrite. And there's evidence to suggest that as well. Um, and then finally, we found some sulfur electron transporters, so they could theoretically grow on some reduced sulfur compounds additionally. So we know now that they have um, a fairly diverse metabolism as well as a novel form of this nitrate oxoreductase protein. But we also wanted to know, are these present within the environment from which we got the samples to begin with? So this is part of um, another master's student work in which there were um, 40 different samples across both Bear Creek and Cherry Creek from water and sediment samples. Um, and we looked for nitrotoga-like sequences, or OTUs as they're said here, um, in each of those samples. We found more in the water, which is on the left here, than we did in the sediment, but we identified nitrotoga-like sequences in 85% of the total samples, and they were more relatively abundant than other forms of nitrate oxidizers in 21% of those samples. So we do know they are present within the Denver area. Um, and then we wanted to look on a larger scale. So this, um, we looked for nitrotoga-like sequences within studies that are deposited into this SRA database. This is a huge database for a collection of raw sequencing data from around the world. Um, and we used an online tool that will query each of those studies in which 16S ribosomal RNA amplicon sequencing was used. So these are all based on 16S identities. Um, and we found, we queried, I think it was 183,000 unique samples. 2,400 of those had at least 100 reads that aligned with these nitrotoga sequences, which is what we're plotting here. And those broke down into a variety of different environments. Um, up here, you're seeing the percent of total environments that are plotted. So for the activated sludge, which is the first one, there were 144 unique samples here that surmised about 15% of all activated sludge um, samples available within the database. So we saw quite a bit in activated sludge, wastewater, freshwater was big with 500 unique samples um, with about 10% of all freshwater sampled being included. And then many of them fell into this other category because all of this data is um, entered manually by different uh, researchers. So getting the exact um, environment from which it came can be difficult. Uh, but we did show they're also not prevalent in marine systems. We didn't find, there were six samples that had reads from uh, marine systems. And with that, we have um, some associated meta metadata, including geographic location. This is about 900 of those 2,400. Um, and we did find that they were spread across the globe, including um, in the northern and southern regions. There's some in, down here in Antarctica, as well as up in Siberia, which is actually where the first nitrotoga um, enrichment came from. It was thought that they only preferred cold environments, but we started to show that they're actually very prevalent in more temperate areas, um, as well as found in a lot of different wastewater treatment facilities and freshwater systems. So overall, we um, found the first Canadatus nitrotoga genomes um, and the first cultivation from a freshwater system. The other cultivation that has come out now came from a wastewater system, so they are very different. Uh, this divergent NXR enzyme 
might indicate a novel evolutionary trajectory of that enzyme. Um, and the multiple metabolisms likely allow metabolic flexibility within their globally distributed habitats within different environments. So going forwards, what we really want to know, um, how do these, how, what is their ecophysiology, including their oxidation kinetics in different environments, and how they might um, react with other nitrate oxidizers within the environment. So like I showed, um, there were other NOBs that were more prevalent than Nitrotoga within the rivers around here. How do they interact? Do they change metabolisms when they're competing for nitrite? We want to know those types of things, um, as well as their resilience to environmental change, um, including Meniere's doing quite a bit of work with uh, antibiotic resistance of these organisms. So, whoops, with that, thank you, and I will take any questions. Awesome. Sure. Um, one of them is, is if you just go back to one of your beginning slides when you had a you were setting up the context. Keep going. And there was a plot on the left that had kind of stacked uh, that right there. Mm -hmm. So you referred to this as a very specific, you had a name for it on the left. What was it? Terragram spring. Oh, um, fixed nitrogen. No, it was kind of a yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you characterized the increase as something that's artificial. Is that right? Yes. What, what does it mean, artificial? Uh, anthropogenic, it's fixed by humans. Um, so I find that humans are non natural? <laughs> <laughs> no, it is an. I mean, aren't all these microbes doing the same thing? Yes. Are these around for the benefit. So why are we different? Because the industrial scale of which is being used is matching, if not doubling, what's being produced. So there's a rate over a finite time horizon, but if you go back far enough, would you expect to see something similar in the microbe world? <laughs> You mean a, a point in time in which there was something? I'm having fun because I'm yeah. sort of not asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fun to think about it. It sets yeah. up the actual question that I wanted to get at, which has sort of been, it doesn't trouble me at all. It's just been something I'm curious about, especially since, you know, Chris Manick, I think, arrived here, and that has to do with using genomes to describe species or species like things. Yeah. You're taking little snippets of sequences. And you're trying to match them up in a, in a way mm -hmm. that is really unique, right? It's, it's different from how we sort of characterize and classify higher level organisms. Right. So I'm wondering if you can work through on the cuff, on the fly, um, kind of a nice uh, analog of what you might be doing if you were to sample a collection of higher organisms, say, at, at, the, uh, at a university or a place or whatever. But, Mimic the process by which you're sampling and describing the microbiota for the same, apply the same process to uh, higher level organism selection. You're talking in terms of speciation? Uh, species characterization, process characterization, traits, all these things that you described. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we look. Um, you do that with higher organisms. I understand what you did really well. You did a great job presenting all this. But what I want you to do is tell us how it would play out if you were talking about higher level organisms that we typically recognize more traditionally as species based on behaviors and rating. Okay. So let's say at a higher level, you would look for different characteristics. We focus mostly on metabolism because they don't have as many physical characteristics. Um, but we look to see how they might behave differently in different environments, whether their capabilities, not whether they are actually using them or not in this case. Um, and I'm trying to think of a better way to answer that. <laughs> so you use genomic data. Yeah. Right? And you're just looking at patterns in, in those strands. Yes. And typically you're characterizing like a colony from one sample or something, right? In this case, yeah. So if you were to have a, a community of, uh, let's say, birds and mammals and fishes mm -hmm. uh, all in the same place, you might take and grind them all up and then mix everything and then pull, pull out some of the 
genetic material and sequence it? Yeah, you can do that. I mean, is that effectively what you're doing? Yeah, like within the cultures that we have in the lab, there are multiple organisms present. We focused on one of those organisms. There are genomes for the other organisms as well. Um, but that was in the assembly process. Yeah. So you're just differentiating between organisms based on what percent similarity or difference? Uh, in terms of differentiating, it looks at the GC content of the organisms as well as the prevalence. You can stack up reads to get a coverage estimate. Okay. And, so like, okay. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, that's a dangerous topic, especially in microbiology. Um, people are arguing about this to currently. Um, those thresholds I mentioned are arbitrary and selected by a group of people that used information from known species um, that were described a while ago. And they found that 95% that cutoff I um, provided dis uh, discriminated most species, not all. I, it's not a catch-all. It doesn't apply equally to all groups of organisms. Um, that was shown within genre, it can change. Some genre are more highly conserved than others. Um, yet, going back in history, when people would just name a species based on different metabolic characteristics, um, they were using that as their guide. Yeah, so what I'm wondering is if you, if you took the same approach, mm -hmm. higher level organisms, what number of species would you have? It would have bigger? Tons. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Smaller number. Okay. Yeah, you'd have orders of magnitude larger is what I would guess. This is all rhetorical stuff. It's interesting to me. Right. So conceptualizing bits and pieces of processes and systems. Seems like. Within this industry culture, yes. But the genomes are estimated to be near complete. If that means anything. What does that mean? Meaning we look for certain genes that are known to be conserved within a group of organisms, upwards of 400 different genes. And within these genomes, there's maybe one missing. <laughs> Based on other organisms within the genus. <laughs> Usually by 16S RNA. Yeah. Now, like E. coli is a great example. They can have ranges within like 70% this uh, average nucleotide of any, but they're still E. coli. <laughs> They, they're very good at swapping large portions of their genome. But that does not apply necessarily to all groups of organisms either. There's no catch-all is what I'm saying, but um, picking something to go with is also helpful from this standpoint. It's a weird, I guess, mind exercise to think what if we took these same approaches and applied them to higher level organisms? Yeah. We started yeah. talking about functional units and things. Oh, yeah, species. it would be, it would totally turn oh, things on its head. I feel like that big rotten species. Well, he mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Well, my species complex or species concept doesn't even apply to microbes. Really? The biological species concept, which is just that. Oh, sexual reproduction? Yeah. Like, yeah, you can't apply that. So <laughs> that's fine. That's like the defensive sort of response. But then what if you take that same approach and you flip it over and you say, well, the biological species concept doesn't apply at all. <laughs> so yeah. then now what do we do, right? That's probably We should throw our hands up. No, no, you don't throw your hands up. <laughs> 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 it's just <laughs> Now it's not necessary to distinguish and differentiate species of higher level organisms, but now you're talking about what is their sort of functional role in a larger system and how do they operate and interact with other bits and so on. I don't know, it's interesting. Yeah. 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 Y
come down with a hundred mile and then grab all oh, over yeah. that. No, yeah. <laughs> not as much as the other ones. Oh, right. There's so a little bit of the want to get all the bridge. Do you want to get the trees as well and the richer than the worms and all these other things that you call species, right? Um, I guess the analogy would be like when I just try and bridge for birds, grab it and then hopefully you got also birds and then go for the trees and then if yeah, birds, all birds, birds, birds function in the same way. Right? <laughs> but occasionally you have mammals that are functioning as birds, yeah, and birds that are functioning But that's a close to an enrichment, right? And then you keep going for just things uh, that are, um, you know, big meta adaptations that are trying to enrich you in that otherwise uh, equally complex. Yeah, so just go to the net. If you've got a whole bunch of organisms that are transporting viruses, you don't want to try and isolate those. In a way that identify differentiating mm -hmm. um, units or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And this one was this metabolism is not conserved uh, based on what is thought for like the 16S phylogeny. This metabolism is like scattered across the whole kingdom of bacteria. It's not thought to be horizontally um, conserved or vertically conserved. Meaning that it was horizontally transferred? Most likely, yeah. We can't say for sure, but these are across different oh, is phylums. That, is that more likely than convergence? What's that? More likely than convergence. So, it might, in a way, yes, but like. That's where it gets, yeah, very complicated. And it only needs to happen once and stick over millions of years. And it can happen more than once, and it can disappear, and it can come back. <laughs> you have some functional data here, and that's the nitride oxidation, right? You said I can measure that. And it disappears. Yeah, yeah, I don't think I showed that. So uh, what about the reverse? Did you said something interesting that you thought really could have been reversed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. Yeah, did you ever I, see it? Did you ever see it, right? We've seen stuff that indicates it might be happening, but I don't know for sure if that's what's happening. If we leave them too long and they go anoxic, basically, yeah. the nitrite is gone and assumingly is sitting as nitrate. And then occasionally it comes back as nitrite with this colorimetric acid that we're seeing. Um, right, but there's a bunch of drawbacks there because these are not isolate cultures either. I can't confidently say that this is what's doing that. It could be some other organism within the culture. But they're highly enriched. Most of them were down less than 10 species. You can. Yeah. Watch the prisms incorporate that. Nitrite. Yeah. They've labeled nitrate decommodized. I assume so, yeah. What is it, 15 and 15? You can do that with nitrogen. And then you can do the pressure with it. Yeah, but there's no guarantee, like I said, other organisms aren't used. This is the only source of nitrogen in the media, too. So it's assuming that those other organisms are taking some of that nitrogen. Since you used all that uh, data from the SRA and you looked for 16S to show that this organism is distributed globally, potentially doing nitrate oxidation. Um, but that's all from shotgun metagenomic data. Why don't you just look for the enzymes to do so phylogenically diverse from the tree from anything else? What, in like MD RASP or just uh, in the SRA, right? Uh, I don't know if the tool you used oh, to do okay, okay. 16S you know, yeah. genomic marker, but why not look for the functional genome? As far as I know, yes, but that's with the so five. Mostly just 16S, right? They yeah. They don't actually compare to other cultures. Right. So instead of looking for the similar organisms, why not look for the tree itself? That's a good idea. It's transferred. Yeah. Can you do that with the tool? That you no, the tool we use, the online tool, is 16S only. It's it's gone through and characterized, pulled out SRAs that are 16S. So you can sub-select those. 
or main OS 900 mm -hmm. thousands. I don't know how many words. How many oh, it's up to 270,000 now. So how many did you find your 60? 2,400. Yeah, so you could pull those 2,400 and just look for that inside of but these are usually just 16S studies that are popping in SRA, not metagenome sequencers. Oh, I thought those were shotgun mm -mm. No, it's Amplicon data usually. Which, if people have uploaded to SRA, we can use. Which more and more people are doing. So David pulled all the 16S from about 3,000 pieces of data, shotgun data. Mm -hmm. So you should look through that. Yeah. And then find those. And then you have it, yeah. Those, you have it. <laughs> yeah, they should be unique, like you said, yeah. yeah. Awesome, thank you. So our next event is on the 24th. It's our first external speaker. Um, thanks for more information on that. Thanks for coming. Can I turn this off?